Is it time to start? I can start, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's 3 o'clock. Hello, everybody. Hey! This is my very first time getting a chance to speak at DerbyCon. Thank you for coming. Uh, I think I put in the description if you feel stuck in your job or you're not happy with work. So look at all of you. <laughs> you're just like, yeah. How do I get the hell out of this one job I got? So a couple things is uh, I generally do stand-up comedy. I also generally move around a lot when I present. Uh, I cannot do that today because I am attached to the podium. So if at any point I pass out or fall over, something has happened, and I'll get to that in a second. Speaking of which, a few things before we get totally into the beginning. Uh, when I get nervous, I tell jokes which is really good in a setting like this, because it's fun, it's great for you guys, but it's terrible when my wife is arguing. <laughs> and she's like, I'm not right. I'm like, <laughs> stop, stop, stop. And she's like, this is really serious. And I'm like, I know, that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> it's just, I can't help it. So I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Marley and Me. Anyone ever seen Marley? Yeah. I had to leave the theater because I couldn't stop laughing. Like, it was terrible. Like, I was like, <laughs> everyone's crying. I'm like, oh my god, this is so funny. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I am prone to anxiety and panic attacks. Uh, I don't know about if you've ever experienced this, but from time to time, I will just completely lock up or whatever. Symptoms may be uh, increased heart rate, good. Muffled sound, all of a sudden I can't hear like anything around me and I'm like, uh, thousand yard stare, if at any point I just, I'm having one, so, uh, and I become way too self-aware, like all of a sudden I can hear like my voice, I know where my hand is, it's in my left pocket, which is weird, so I'm going to take that out now, like all of a sudden I get really self-aware, uh, and the reason why is because I have self-doubt, you know, I woke up this morning at 6 a.m. and I'm like, people are coming to listen to me, I better say something. Uh, and then some of that is the fears of being judged or uh, criticized or uh, rejected. And I don't know if you've ever had these feelings, um, but I'm saying to you right now, even though I have these feelings, I'm up here and I'm hoping this goes well. But the thing about this is, is I turned this into a mutant ability. Uh, I grew up with comic books, I worked in the comic book industry, and I believe in mutant abilities. You have this thing about you that helps you in certain situations. So I believe my anxiety and panic attacks help me in so many other situations because I feel like I'm not even in that situation. And I'm like, it's not even happening. Like, stuff's happening, but I don't care. It's like, it's not a thing. <laughs> like, right now. Okay. Uh, but the reason I, like I said, I'm telling you this is one, because if I say it out loud, it no longer becomes a fear. Uh, and then the other thing is, if you ever experience this, or as I'm going through these slides, all of a sudden you start thinking about the things that you may have to do that's way out of your comfort zone, you may start thinking to yourself like, but I have anxiety problems. And that's fine. I do too, but I still get up on stage, I still do the things, and you can still do those things too. It's just going to be uncomfortable like this right now. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I, even, even though that the company I work for is a sponsor of this event, I am not here uh, on behalf of that company. So if you see me work in a booth, I'm not here to help sell something. I'm just here because I wanted to submit a CFP for DerbyCon because I thought that would be cool. And your current employer may not appreciate the things I'm about to say. If your current employer is like, you went to what at DerbyCon? How to find your dream job? Do you know what it's like to tell your current employer I'm about to give a talk at an InfoSec conference about how to social engineer near your way into your dream job? They're like, did you do that to us? <laughs> kind of. All right. So what you may be thinking right now is like, wait, I'm in, he's a marketing guy? But do you even security, bro? And I get this a lot, mainly from one person. His name's Stephen Hilt. He's here somewhere. Whenever I post something, this is his response to all of it. <laughs> and the answer to your question is no, I don't security, bro. I don't. 
Uh, but that's why you should kind of listen to this talk about how to market yourself, how to promote yourself, how to find a dream job, because those are the, the things I'm good at. Please protect my credit card information. That's what you guys are good at. Make sure that my mom doesn't get scammed in a phishing attack. Like, that's the things that you guys do. The things that I do is I help people find work, and I'm, you know, I, I promote things. That's what I do. So listen to those parts. I'll listen to those things that you know. But then when I got accepted for DerbyCon, I got this in response. I was like so excited. I was like, hey, my talk got accepted at DerbyCon. And then this. <laughs> so. All right. No, I don't security, bro. Like I said, I was born a Nigerian prince. I was born. I was born this way. And I didn't realize what my natural gifts were until about, uh, I was eight. And my mom, who used to do yard sales, was having a yard sale. And she said, Jason, do you want to help the yard sale today? And I said, no, I don't. And she's like, well, do you want to sell, like, snacks at the yard sale and make some money? And I was like, okay. She's like, here, let's take some brownies and some tasty cakes, and we'll take them out of the packages, and then you sell them for more than we bought the package for. I was like, okay, and it worked. I made like 10, 15 bucks that day. And then I reinvested that 10 and $15 into candy. And then I took that to school. And I was a candy dealer in the second grade. <laughs> I was selling now laters and blow pops and, <laughs> and nerds. I was making bank, <laughs> bank. I had a fanny pack because it's the 80s. I had a fanny pack. And that fanny pack was full of candy, and I was bringing in money every single day. I was like the Heisenberg and Jesse of that school. <laughs> and so I'm just this way. I, that's the thing that I am. But the reason why I called this How to Social Engineer Way into Your Dream Job is, one, I wanted people to show up because I thought you would think that was cool. You're like, oh, How to Social Engineer. No, not really. Kind of. So uh, the difference between social engineering and marketing is very slim. There's very different, you know, very minute difference. My entire day, like most of my day, the work that I do, internally, what I'm thinking is, please, for the love of God, click the link. I put the link on Twitter. I put the link in your email. I put the link here. I put the link there. Just click the link. Just click it. And you know what every single phishing attack is thinking? Just click the link. <laughs> Just click the link. Release the malware. I'm the same way. I just like, I want you to click the link, find out about things, and then buy it if you want to. But the thing I want to talk about today is there's a difference between deception and persuasion. Nothing I talk about today, I want you to be deceptive. When you're pre uh, presenting yourself, promoting yourself, talking about yourself, you're not being deceptive. You're being persuasive. You're telling people who you are, uh, what skills you have, the abilities that you can do, that kind of stuff, but you're not lying about it. There's a difference. Uh, and then I believe there's a difference between a scam artist and a salesperson. And this difference is this. If you believe the thing that you're selling is good for the other person, if, you're, if you think it's going to benefit them or fix something in their life, then you're a salesperson. You're, you're making their life better. If you were just doing it to make money to make your life better, then you're a scam artist. So think about yourself. If you're going to go work for a company, are you going to work for that company just to absorb their money and not do anything? Or are you going to go work for a company where you're actually contributing and making that company better? Because if you think you're going to a company to make it better, then you're being a salesperson of your skills and your abilities. If you're just going there to scam, then you're being a scam artist and deceptive. And I can't help you with that. And then I get this a lot. Am I being confident or arrogant? Oh. Most of you today will leave going, what an arrogant bastard. My wife is sitting in the front row. <laughs> She'll be one of the... Yeah, honey, okay. All right. All right. Uh, moving on. Okay. So why are you in this talk? You know, I, I was thinking about why you would wait in that line out there, why you would come in this room, why would you sit down, why would you listen to this guy? And I was thinking, maybe you're curious. Like, what the hell is this guy going to talk about? I have nothing to do between three and four. Might as well. Uh, maybe some of you are here for skill development. You're like, maybe he has a thing that I could add to my skills of doing social engineering or ocean gathering or something like that. Maybe you're currently searching for work. Some of you in here are searching for work. Some of you are unhappy with your current job. 
I, I just saw a hand go up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> some of you are undecided if you're unhappy with your job. And uh, I'll talk about that in the next slide. And some of you are like, I know there's this thing out there that's way better than this thing that I have, and it's this dream job that I've created for myself that if I could have it, I think I would be happy. And then golden handcuffs. Some of you in here just have golden handcuffs. You're paid really well, and you are so afraid to make a, a change that getting paid really well, because you have a mortgage, you have debt, you have this, you have that, you have kids, you have all these things, and you're like, I'm just going to go to work every day until I die, and it's going to be fine. <laughs> it's going to be fine. <laughs> we go out on the boats on Sundays when it's not raining. It's fine. That's what I live for. <laughs> in between the, the weeks. <laughs> okay. So, you know, whatever gets you through. All right. <laughs> so, real quick about the are you currently in your dream job or looking for one? There's only one thing I'm going to recommend that you read or buy or anything today, and it's this one book called The Dip. And it is a tiny book. You, you will miss it on the shelf, so just get it from Amazon. I don't make any money by you buying this book. I just really like it. It's about this big, it's like physically this big, and then like really thin. As you're reading it, you're going to go, I don't know what any of this means. And then read it again. And the second time you read it, you go, oh, wow. Because it's about, are you in a dip where you can get better? Or are you actually, is it time to just quit and go try something else? And so I do highly recommend this. I read this about every year or every two years, you know, to see if I should keep the dog or not, you know, stuff like that. That was weird. I said that out loud. All right. So when you're looking at coming up with a dream job, a, a tip for you is to make a list of wants. And uh, a person very near and dear to me, right, can I say what you're doing? Okay. So when you're thinking about that dream job, actually write down what it is. Seriously, write down what the dream job is. Because if you don't, if it's like, you know, I've, I talked to a lot of, I used to teach and talk to a lot of students. I was like, so what's your dream job, Doug? Like, Making enough money. Good God. <laughs> and I would say, well, what's enough? And like, enough? It's like, oh, well, so you haven't really planned this out. Okay. For me, Enough money is I never have to worry about eating, ever. Like, that's enough money. I never have to worry about food. I will always have food. That's enough money. You know, I could want a boat. I don't really want a boat, honey. I'm just, I don't know why boats keep coming. <laughs> so make a list of your wants. Like, specific wants, not enough or in the future, stuff like that. So if you pursue your dream job, here are some things that are going to happen to you. If you're sitting in this room right now and you're like, you know, I'm thinking about it. Your heart's starting to beat a little bit faster. You're like, you know, let's go for that dream job. Starting tomorrow. It's like when you go on a diet. You're like, tomorrow I'm starting that diet. But if you really start thinking like, tomorrow I want to pursue my dream job, you will grow to be courageous. You will grow to be courageous. Right now you're not, but you will grow to be courageous. I want to do a little experiment. Raise your hand if you're shy. Exactly. Like, there's half of you who put your hand up. The other half was like, but I'm too shy to raise my hand. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> All of us are shy. We are. We're just shy people. And, and in the InfoSec community, even more shy than other communities I've been a part of. And just shy. And a lot of that shyness comes from rejection. That shyness comes from, you know, uh, fear of, you know, all kinds of fears and things like that. But you're shy. And so the one thing I want to, want you to think about. Think of a social engineer. Are they shy? Maybe on the inside, but when it's time to do what they do, they take on a persona. They take on a role. They take on, you know what? For the next 15 minutes, I can hop on this phone and I will fish the hell out of this person. Yeah. <laughs> and when they're done with that call, they're like, oh, 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 man, that was terrifying and exciting all at the same time. But when you leave this room here today, that shyness, what if you practice 30 seconds of courageousness? What if you, when you leave this room, you go, you know what? For the next 15 minutes, I'm not going to be shy. And you go up and you talk to random strangers. 
for 15 minutes after this. If all of you do it, you're going to freak all of them out. <laughs> so maybe just mill around in the hallway, talk to each other. <laughs> you're going to stretch your skills. So stretch your skills. Because you're going to have to learn new things to be able to get that job that you want. You're going to stretch your skills like crazy. You're going to fail a lot. And this is going to be like a mantra. Damn, this sucks. Like, I keep failing. This sucks. You're going to wreck your life. You will literally, like, that's the part of this. You're going to wreck your life because the life you currently have that you want to not have, you won't have anymore. Does that make sense? Like, you will wreck your life. Whatever the life is you have right now will be destroyed by trying to do this. And so some of you will get about two feet into this. And you're like, you know what? I'm good. Never mind. I'm going to go back to my house now. And everything was fine. It was fine. It's fine. The reason I raised my voice is because in our house, the Blanchard house, we have a, a thing. And it's when someone asks you a question, the way you respond and how high your voice is is how untruthful you're being. <laughs> it sounds a little like this. So how was your day? Or, does this dress make me... No! <laughs> Not at all! It's fine. Totally fine. <laughs> so... <laughs> the one thing that most of you will probably potentially discover is that you're currently in your dream job. You're going to go look for it, you're going to find it like, I don't like the commute for this one job. I don't like this for this job. I don't like this for that. And like all of a sudden you're going to go, you know what? I have my dream job. And when you realize you do have your dream job, you'll actually treat the job you currently have different. And then what happens if you succeed and you get your dream job? Crap. Now what? All right, so a little bit about me. You know, I've kind of started with these things. Uh, why are you listening to me? Uh, I started in the Army in 1996. I was a combat videographer. I made videos for the United States military. Uh, I made propaganda films, recruitment videos, tra uh, training films, things like that. Uh, it was good times. I learned a, a very nice trade in the military that I used. I then taught at Full Sail University, which is a film school in Orlando, Florida. I taught for nine years at that school. I taught producing and, and editing and storytelling and things like that. Uh, I also ran a small boutique production company at the same time. We did photo shoots and music videos. And I would, it was before YouTube. And uh, I was able to start making short films that went viral, like back before YouTube even existed. I made a short film called Dangers of the Internet, What Every Girl Must Watch. It was a really generic title. Uh, it got a million views in 24 hours before YouTube. The data company called me and said, who are you? And I was like, why? They're like, you're running like a terabit, terabyte of bandwidth like an hour. And I was like, oh my God, is that expensive? <laughs> and they said, it really is. And I was like, oh God. And they're like, can we sponsor you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, yeah, you just put our link right underneath your video. And I'm like, okay. Said, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, I owned, uh, I, I like to call it the world's most famous comic book store, because I work in marketing. Uh, but uh, I owned a comic shop in Orlando, Florida, where we became the modern comic book store, which we inspired most comic book stores that are now doing things. Like, we built a bar inside our store. Like a bar. Like a bar. Bar. Where you could drink. All right. Uh, I worked, uh, I owned a, an art gallery for a little while, then I went to work for DC Comics. When I got to work at DC Comics, like, you should see my face, like, on my day one of, like, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm here. <laughs> uh, there's a guy named Jeff Johns, if you know the comic book industry. Uh, Jeff Johns was my boss. And he walked up, and he's like, hey, like to welcome you to the, Jason, what are you doing here? And I was like, I work for you now, Jeff. <laughs> he's like, okay, cool. I was like, all right, cool. All right. I then went to work for Warner Brothers, and I started their social media department for their old movies, which was really cool. Like, my first uh, job was Goodfellas. They gave me Goodfellas to be the, like, sole promoter of, and I was like, are you serious? Do you know how many times I've seen this movie? 
like a thousand times. I think I've seen it. It was the first DVD I bought in 1996 when I got a DVD player. In fact, the encryption on that DVD, or like the, 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 the way they got it, like the audio was off on that by like eight seconds by the time you got to, you flip, and the guy, okay, Jason, okay. So cool, thanks. Uh, I left Warner Brothers to go work for a company called Diamond Comics, and I ran something called Free Comic Book Day for a few years. Raise your hand if you read comics or know what Free Comic Book Day is. All right, cool. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I ran Free Comic Book Day for a few years, and now I work for the Sands Institute as a uh, marketing manager for pen testing and net wars. So the one thing I want you to get out of the next couple slides is this. Please don't be me. Because you're not me, you work in InfoSec, I work in marketing, and so take the bits and pieces that work for you and the parts that don't work for you don't. So treat it like a buffet. If at some point I put out like a, like a really nice brisket, and you're like, I like that brisket, then you eat that brisket. And you take that brisket home with you, like in a little to-go container. That's what I'm talking about. All right. So since don't be like me, be like you. And I love this. I don't know if you've ever seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But I live my life by this. And I know that's weird, honey. I know. I'm sorry. I'm your husband. But there are four kinds of people in this world. There's the looks, the brains, the wild card, and the muscle. And the reason why you may not like the job you have right now is because they are treating you like the brains when all you want to be is the wild card. And you want to go find that wild card job. Or you're the wild card in your job, but you really want to be the looks. So what's the difference? The looks is somebody that wants to take credit. They want to lead. They want to be in front of people. They want to be the, the person who speaks and presents. That's the looks. They want that. The brains is the person who's very calmly sitting behind the scenes, making sure all that architecture and those things happen. Then there's the wild card. I love being the wild card. I am the one in the meetings that says, can we just send like a billion of them? And they're like, Jason, we can't send a billion. How about 10,000? Yeah, we could send 10,000. 20,000. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I'm going to throw out something. Uh, we had a guy on, on our team when, we owned the com when I owned the comic book store that he was the wild card. That was like his place. And so we, I'd be saying something. He's like, that's the stupidest idea. What if we just paint it purple? And I was like, Mike, we can't. You know what? Purple would actually get a lot of attention. Yeah, let's paint it purple. Yeah. 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 So there's the wild card is so needed in all organizations. They're the ones that are just throwing out those ideas. And maybe that's what you want to be, but someone's got you being the muscle. The muscle is someone that just does the work, the grunt work that the looks takes all the credit for. That the brains is the one that actually implemented and now the muscle's doing. And the wild card is just like, I don't want to do any work. I just want to throw out crazy ideas all day. That's what I want to do. And so the muscle is just this person. And some of you right now are doing the muscle job, but you're like, I want to be the brains. So go find that brains job. Or you know what? There's some days I just want to make sandwiches at Subway. Like, I really do. Like, there are some days where I was like, I am so tired of doing all these things. You know what I'd love to do? Just make sandwiches at Subway. But I can't because I got golden hand. No, sorry. <laughs> So what's the scope? So I'm, the next couple of slides, uh, I work in, you know, I'm marketing manager for pen testing, and I hear pen test methodology all the time. So I'm trying to adapt this talk to pen test methodology so that way you may be able to understand it better. So what's the scope? I highly encourage you, if you're planning to go for your dream job, that you put money aside in a budget. Because some of the things I'm going to talk about actually cost money. And so you have to think to yourself, if I want my next job to be a 40% raise, or a 50% raise, or a 60% raise. And what is that? Let's say that over the next five years, you're going to make an additional $100,000. Would you then invest $5,000 to make an additional $100,000? You know, you have to start thinking about that. Like, what am I going to invest into myself to be able to do these things? So how much money are you willing to spend? Because some of that might be you get on a plane and you go to somewhere for an interview. And that might be you get on a plane and come to DerbyCon. This is a part of your investment. And so you flew here to network with people to find those jobs. And so put money aside. Timeline. When do you want to have this job by? Five years, four years, three years, next week? Six years? Put a date on it. 
Because if you do not put a date on this, it will always be that thing that you're going to do. Like, I don't know, there's so many projects around my house that I haven't gotten to because I'm going to do them. And my wife wants to know, when are you going to do them? And I'm like, soon. <laughs> soon? <laughs> so put a date on it. Like, literally. I, I, when I quit my old job and I went to, to do this, I put a date in the calendar. One year from now, I'm going to have this job. So do that. And the other reason why that's important is because some of you are going to leave this talk. You're going to go out there for 15 minutes and be totally courageous. You're going to say all kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be tomorrow and all the things that you learned over the weekend and all the beer and everything else that you drank and all comes together. And all of a sudden, you're like, wait, what did Jason say? Dream job. Nah, I'm good. So put a date down. I have this uh, philosophy about marketing. The keys to an effective, sustained marketing campaign are these. Get people to know you exist. Right now, there's about eight companies out there that would hire you. I'm, I'm just guessing. There's eight companies out there that would hire you with a better wage and better benefits, but they have no idea you exist. And since they don't know you exist, they can't even potentially hire you. So step one is to get people to know you exist. Step two is give them a reason to care. Just because they know you exist doesn't mean you care. I walked down the halls and I was trying to hand out things to people. I was like, hi, would you like an advertisement? I literally said this. Hi, would you like an advertisement? They are like, no, 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 no. As I was like, want an advertisement? Want an advertisement? Want an advertisement? No. And then I walked down the same line with the same people. Would you like a free bag? Yeah, I'll take a free bag. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Find a way to become a free bag. <laughs> and then once they get to know you, or once they know you exist, you give them a reason to care, and you know, like, that person's pretty cool, or that thing they did, the, the tool they came up with, that, that, the way they won that CTF, whatever it is, make sure that you amaze them in some way. And right now, here's where that self-doubt starting to creep in. I don't know if I can amaze anyone. Yeah, you could listen to that voice. Who are my target companies? Let's get into reconnaissance. There are companies out there that you would love to work for. Well, who are they? Make a list of them. I went through this phase where I wrote down a list of all the companies I wanted to work for. And then I started finding out who worked at those companies. And then I started finding out who should I reach out to at those companies. And then I started contacting the people at those companies. And so make a list. There are some companies that will be really hard to work for because they're small, they're, they're co close-knit. You need to overcome a huge hurdle to get into that company. But there are the other companies that aren't. And so you start researching your companies and seeing what works. There are gatekeepers. And these gatekeepers may be recruiters or, or hiring managers or whoever they are, but you start finding out who are the gatekeepers that I need to talk to. But how do I figure out this stuff? Let me see what my... All right. I don't have much time for a live demo, but Dave Kennedy. I'm moving over here. Okay, so DerbyCon. So one of the things that I do in marketing is I find out why and who is influential. And so what this is, is DerbyCon's Twitter account. They're following 1,061 people. So I clicked on who those 1,061 people were, and they were these people here. And as I was going through this list, I found a company called Talos. I think I said it right. Talos Group, yes. And then I went to Talos page, and I looked at Talos and who they follow. And as I was looking at who they followed, I found this guy, born in New York City, living the dream in D.C., career services manager for Talos. Well, hello, new friend. <laughs> It took like three minutes. It really did. And then, because I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, I run targeted Twitter campaigns where I target certain ads to certain people so that way they see it. And I want to make sure it's a very minute audience so that way I don't have to spend that much money and that the ad is relevant. And so what if you ran 
an ad on Twitter, and you can look this up and figure it out, but you ran an ad on Twitter that says, I'm currently seeking employment. Click on my link. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just click the link. Just click it. <laughs> click on my link to, to learn more about me or to see what I can do for your organization. And so you can run a, a targeted Twitter campaign against the people who follow DerbyCon. Who follows DerbyCon? Wouldn't you want the people in this room to see that? And so you can run this for, let's say, two weeks, and it gets 40 click-throughs, and you, you had to pay $3 per click-through, and now you're at $120. This is why I want you to set some money aside for your budget to be able to find these things. And so just using simple Twitter, now here's what I could do. I could also target Talos. So Christopher would then start seeing my ad. I could target individual companies. You can do this on Facebook. So a quick story. I was doing Facebook advertising. I created a Facebook page for myself called Hire Jason Blanchard. I had ads saying Hire Jason Blanchard. That's, that was the title. There was pictures of me. Hire Jason Blanchard. When you went to the page, I treated a Facebook page like a resume. When you clicked on links, it took you to projects. When you clicked on link, it took you to a news article about me. When you clicked on links, it took you to my business. Like it, it was a thing that showed you who I was. And then I ran ads targeting people at certain companies that I wanted to work for. And so some of those companies were like Warner Brothers and DC Comics and Marvel and Sony Pictures. And then I could also get really, because at the time I wanted a social media job, so I could target the people who had those job titles. And then what happened was I got a call from a person who had gotten my name. She called me and she's like, hey, we're getting ready to start this new social media department. Do you know anything about Facebook? Big ass smile got on my face. I was like, if you go to facebook.com slash hire Jason Blanchard, you can learn more about me. <laughs> she then typed it in and she said, oh my God. I've seen you on Facebook for like the last five months. I was like, well, then why did it take so long to call me? I work in, I work in marketing. Yes, they hired me. Yes. So take your SE skills, take your OSINT gathering skills, and apply it to this. Now, just one real quick thing. How much OSINT gathering is too much for a potential interviewer? Yeah. I was, I was thinking about this. Uh, like, imagine you go into an interview, like you've done your research, you've been running your ads, targeting people at these companies, they've clicked on it, they've followed up with it, they've reached out to you. you. You're now in an interview, and you're sitting down with, you know, that guy, and you go, have you thought about getting new running shoes? <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry, what? He's like, well, you've put about 500 miles on the shoes you got right now. <laughs> Just wondering if you want to get new shoes or not. And have you ever thought about like running someplace different? <laughs> so. You know, that's up to you, how weird you want to make that interview. <laughs> but I guarantee you will be remembered. <laughs> All right. So what are the skills that you need? Uh, I do recommend going to hiring blogs, finding interviewer questions, because you work in a very technical industry. And so you may walk into an interview, and the person says, what happens when you go to Google.com? And you're like, the website comes up. That might not be what they were looking for. They might have wanted to know exactly how that happens. And so look at certain interviewer questions so that you can prepare yourself to walk into technical interviews. The other thing is develop your skills. Let's say you have a three-year goal for this. Well, in the next year, you want to take training. And then you want to get a cert. But what cert do you get? This is a, there's a really cool thing that you can do. And I don't have the internet up here. So write this down, because it's not in my slides. I work for a company that has very specialized certifications, and each one of those certifications has a very unique set of 
letters, GCIH, GPEN. Uh, so if you have one of those certs and you go to LinkedIn and you do a search for that specific certification, it will bring up one, every person who has it, so that way you can do some OSINT gathering. Two, it will also bring up every job that is currently posted with that certification that they're looking for. So you just type in whatever search you got, it then says here's the 582 jobs that is requiring that search, and you start going through limiting to a certain area or certain this in certain companies. Okay. CTFs. Real quick plug for the Holiday Hack Challenge. Uh, every year it comes out. Have you ever done the Holiday Hack Challenge? Raise your hand. Uh, if you're looking for skill development building, the Holiday Hack Challenge is available right now for last year's. And if you do it and you get stuck somewhere, well, we've already finished it. So that way you can go to the write-ups that people have done and say, well, this is what I did. So this is a great way to build your skills for free. There's no cost to this. And then there's also the pivotproject.org where you can build your skills for free there as well. Okay, so if you remember anything from this talk today, it's this. And I want you, when I used to teach film school, I used to have all my students repeat this after me, but I'm not going to do that here at Derby because I don't want anyone to ice me later. So here we go. But I used to ask them to say this and repeat it with me. And it was, it's what I tell myself before I, I have to go networking. Because I say have to because I don't like it. I'm shy. I get anxiety. And so I, I say this to myself. Never deny someone else the opportunity to find out how awesome you are. Think about that. When you decide, damn it. <laughs> When you decide not to walk up to someone else, you're already saying to yourself, I'm not worth their time. That's stupid. So stop. Network at CTFs. We do the uh, Tournament of Champions each year for, for Networks, and it's the people who've won all over the world. So they were in the top five, top ten, and they're CTFs all over the world, and they get to come to D.C. and play each other. It's amazing because there's more hacking ability in the luncheon that we have than most nation states. It's incredible. And they all get a chance to meet each other and talk to each other and network with each other. I've seen, uh, we, we did a CTF uh, in Austin last year, and the, the guy who won was amazing. Amazing. And then at the end, some other guys walked up, and they're like, hey, who do you work for? And uh, he told them, and they're like, do you want to stay there? It's like, no. No. <laughs> He's like, do you want to come work for us? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> so, these are good places. Sorry. These are good places to meet each other. Training events. Uh, when you go to training events like this, it's kind of a training event, but when you go to other training events, meet the other people there. And then recruiters. You know, I have some friends in the InfoSec industry that when they get an email from a recruiter, they, they think it's terrible. They're like, stupid recruiter, reached out to me, job doesn't make any sense. Ah, oh, stupid recruiter. Do you know what I would think if a recruiter reached out to me? Well, hello, new friend. I see you've sent me an email today that doesn't match my skills or qualifications, but let me tell you the skills and qualifications I do have. Because apparently you're handing out jobs or something. <laughs> I almost just missed my mouth. <laughs> you would have seen like it just running down here. <laughs> it was so close. All right. All right, there's this really cool thing on LinkedIn called InMail. I'm going to go back to it super fast. And the reason why I had Dave's account up is because I am not currently linked in with Dave, which is weird. I'm going to have to fix that. But there's a thing here called send David in mail. If you upgrade your LinkedIn account for a very brief period, once again, this is a part of your budget to go off and, and so you upgrade your LinkedIn account. You can send like 10 emails or you can pay for an in mail. You know what I do when I pay for in mails? I just send it to like VPs, hiring managers. Well, hello, CEO of this company I'd love to work for. Here's an in-mail. 
And you can send it to anyone, and it's guaranteed to get delivered. But if they don't respond within seven days, you get it back. And there are some times where I would email like a VP, because it's like three, four bucks to send one of these. If you want more, it's like $10 to send one of these. So it's kind of expensive. Like you have to pick and choose who you want to send these to. But if you find that gatekeeper at that company that you want to work for and you want to make sure that you introduce yourself, then this might be that way to, to make that first interaction. But there was times where it's like day six and they hadn't responded yet. And I'm starting to think, about it, just don't respond. Please don't respond. Because on day seven, I get that credit back and I can email, email someone else. So this is a good thing. It's also, it could cost you. So that's a way to use LinkedIn that way. And then I already showed you how to use Twitter to find influencers or people who, that you would want to reach out to. So here's a really cool thing. Have any of you, you ever requested, like you can do this through LinkedIn or whatever, you just contact someone at another company like, hey, can we grab lunch? Can we grab dinner? Can we do a happy hour or something? You just ask them for an inter, and it's like an informal interview where you just sit down, you hang out with them, you, you swap stories and stuff like that. But at the end of that, you may think to yourself, I never want to work for this company, that person is a total jackass. Or you leave that comp you leave that meeting and you're like, that was really cool. I like the environment that I was in. I, I like that. So request informal interviews with people. And I, I, this worked a lot for me. I would just request, hey, can we get coffee? Just meet for like 10 minutes before you go to work and just say hi. All right. So what does a good resume look like? We're in the exploitation phase right now. What's a re good resume look like? Uh, I have no idea. When I submitted my resume for the company I currently work for, they were like, we really like you, but this resume is terrible. Because I was always trying to find jobs in marketing and social media and uh, production companies and the entertainment industry. And so mine was tailored for that. And so when I came to this, the company I'm with now, they're like, eh. So th I was asked, do you see the bullets in what we're looking for? I was like, mm-hmm. Could you just write a thing that goes with the bullet? And I was like, genius. <laughs> Why have I never thought of this? <laughs> You want to know this, here's an example. <laughs> you want to know this, here's an example. You want to know this, here's an example. And I thought it was a really boring resume, but I'm currently working for this company. <laughs> so you never know. All right. So when you're sending this in to that hiring manager or whoever it's going to, it's the, you're really thinking this. Like you, That's where that social engineer kind of clicks in. You're like, could you just click on it? Could you click on the link? Could you click on the thing? Could you open the email? It's not weaponized. I promise. Totally promise this time. Totally. <laughs> Here's a fun thing. If you're doing your, uh, you know, you're, you're researching, you're, you're, if you find out they have a working fax machine, fax your resume. It's going to freak everyone out. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, the fax machine turns on for like the first time in three years. <laughs> and like someone walks past like, something's coming in on the facts. What is this? And here's what your cover letter should look like. It's a Sharpie on a plain sheet of paper. And it said, if you think I'm this good and I can track you down, wait till you see the other ways I can do it. One, you're going to creep them out. But two, that's the kind of thing they show to everybody. They're like, we got a fax with a weird Sharpie thing. All right. <laughs> so a couple other things. Uh, at this current, how much time do I have? Like, when is? Seven minutes. OK. <laughs> so let's say you're at a conference. And, and I, I. I didn't tell Dave I was going to do this. Did anyone see this in your bag? Raise your hand if you saw this. Not all of you, huh? Damn it. All right, okay. But this right here, uh, as a sponsor, we're able to put things in bags. I was wondering if I was someone looking for work, if I could ask Dave, hey, Dave, could I send you 
a box of resumes with my picture on one side. I'm going to be at DerbyCon, come find me. Let's talk about working together. And on the other side, it's your resume. How much would Dave charge for that? You know what I'm thinking right now, though? Next year at DerbyCon, there's going to be like 90 resumes <laughs> in that bag. Everyone's like, I'm not opening it. I'm not. So this only works a few times. It doesn't work when everyone does it. So you have to think about what's that thing for you. I, I love the spinning wheel I have in my booth. I have Plinko, things like that. And uh, sometimes people walk up and they're like, hey, what's the spinning wheel for? And I go, it's a social engineering tactic to get people to come talk to me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the hotel bar. Uh, I have to tell this quick story about Leonard Nimoy and Jonathan Frakes. So I, I come from the comic book industry. What I found out over time is that all the comic creators and, and stars from these old TV shows and everything, they would get together in the, the bar that had the lowest rate because that's where the convention would put everybody. And so they would all meet each other because it would be weird for them to go out into the town because if they went into the town, then it would be like, oh my God, it's Leonard Nimoy! You know, so it freaks them out. So they all stay together. So I learned that they all went to that bar. So when I went to the bar, I walked in, and there's Leonard Nimoy and Jonathan Frakes having lunch. And I was like, it's like number one and number one having lunch together. <laughs> and then later that night, like Jonathan Frakes is playing like table hockey with Jeff Johns, and I'm like, I'm in like a nerd. Where's Joss Whedon? Like, <laughs> that's all we need at this point. <laughs> so. The hotel bar, and you guys mostly already know this, but the other thing about the hotel bar is the one drink rule. When you are actively networking, I would like you to stick to a one drink rule. And when you have that one drink, you keep it full at all times. Because the moment it empties, someone wants to fill it for you. And you might want to fill it for someone else. But after seven drinks, I remember, I remember this one time. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I went up to a, a very prominent comic creator the next day, and I was like, hey, it's great to meet you. And he's like, we talked for a while last night. Did we? He's like, you showed me your tattoo on your back. It's of your business. Oh, my God, that's true. Oh, my God. <laughs> so that, yeah, the one drink room. So... I, at one point, I had HireJasonBlanchard.com. So you could have HireSoAndSo.com. And on that, you have all these things about you. You could run remarketing campaigns on Google that if anyone visits that website, then you follow them for like the next six weeks, every single website that they go to. They keep seeing your face over and over and over. You can do that in the creepiest way possible. I would like you to create a new email account for searching for jobs. And the email should say something like, badasspentester at gmail.com. Something to that effect that amazing DFIR forensics analyst at gmail. Like, put what you're doing in your email address so that way people on instantly know. And then social media, I already showed you how to run ads. So in the interview process, how do you get used to talking to strangers? I recommend talking to strangers. The one thing I really do recommend is if you're looking at getting a job at, let's say, this is your dream job, do not contact them first. Contact the company you never, ever want to work for first. For practice. Because when you don't give a damn about working for somebody, you're so calm on the phone. You're like, so what are you thinking about doing in the next five years? A lot of things. I have a list. It's very specific. Let's go through it. <laughs> but if it's that dream job and it's your very first call and you're like, so what do you think about doing it in the next five years? I don't know. Things. <laughs> stuff. Lots of stuff. Okay. All right. <laughs> so to go through this, uh, you have to, at some point, let's say a three-month check-in, What's working? What's not working? Uh, at the end of this, I'm going to really think hard about what I did here. Did this work? Is a big picture of me, if you can't see this. Is this effective? Is this a good thing? So at the end of this, I'm going to take a look at how many of these got turned in, and you still have time to turn them in. That's my one plug for these. 
there's only 62 other people, your odds are pretty damn good. So this right here, I'm going to evaluate it. And you need to evaluate what you're doing. Does it work or does it not work? All right, I'm almost done. Some of you right now may be thinking these things. You're hesitating. You're like, you know what? I could do it, but I'm not thinking about it. You have doubts. You have fears. Some of you right now are like, I picked the wrong talk right now. <laughs> that guy's a charlatan. I spent an hour in a marketing presentation. <laughs> what was I thinking? The, every once in a while, I'll go to a marketing conference, and you can't. A marketing conference about marketing given by marketers is the worst thing on the face of the planet. <laughs> You may be feeling excited, overwhelmed. Some of you are just apathetic. You're like, I walked in feeling this way. I'm going to walk out feeling this way. Thanks, talky man. <laughs> Some of you are going to leave here really determined. You're like, yes, I'm going to get that damn dream job I've been thinking. Some of you right now are like, oh, I already have enough on my plate. This is not what I needed today. And some of you are just going to say, sigh, because I can't do any of those things. So I'm just going to stay where I'm at. That might make you a sad panda. Now, what happens if you actually get job offers? Because this, it's going to start happening. I have never gotten just one job offer. When I'm doing this, I normally have two or three. And that sucks. It does. You're like, all these companies want you. You're like, but what's the right one? And so you actually have to think about that. And here's what I love. If anyone offers you a salary, I want you to instantly go, and I'd also like bonuses. Like, what do you mean? I'm really uh, driven by incentives. If I do better, I want you to pay me more. Like, but we don't do that for anyone else. It's about time you started. <laughs> so benefits. Uh, I, once they offer you a salary, Say thank you, talk about the bonuses, they may say no, you know, whatever that is. But after they've offered you the salary, then say, you know what else I'd like? I'd like you to send me to training at least once a year. I want you to send me to training so I can get better at what I do. And I want you to pay for the cert, too. I don't want to have to worry about that. And I want you to send me to training, and I want you to help me develop my skills because I know that you're investing in me as much as I'm investing in here five days a week. Countering. That's going to be the scariest thing you ever do. And I don't know how to help you through that. But don't turn to drinking. Because <laughs> that's not going to be the place you make that best decision. Let's make good leader decisions. Multiple offers, I already talked about that. Kind of. Here's the best way to decide between two really good job offers. Ready? Flip a coin. I'm serious. Because as soon as the coin lands, you'll know exactly which job you actually wanted. Because I have an 11-year-old daughter, because I flipped a coin. And that's a story I can tell you in the hallway. All right, and my last thing is this. Uh, it's going to be, whenever you're looking for a job and you already have one, it's weird. It's a weird feeling. Like, just as a human being, it's a weird feeling. And when it's time to put in your two weeks notice and, and say, you know, it's been good, we had great times, you guys kind of sucked a lot, there was many things I would way improve, uh, but you know, like whatever. But like, as you give, it still it feels weird, because when you give your notice, there may be, please don't go. And there's going to be a part of you that says, if you treated me better, we wouldn't even be here right now. <laughs> but let's say they do come back with a great counteroffer, and they do, and you're like, you know what? That's actually. I kind of wish you would have offered me that $40,000 extra like nine months ago and we wouldn't even be here right now. But nice. The thing is, if you decide to stay, most people, if they decide to stay in a job, it, it still ends within like six 
to six months to a year because it, it doesn't change. They're still in the same job and then they, all that stuff. So if you decide to stay, make sure that everyone understands that things are going to change. Management's going to change. Structure's going to change. Benefits are going to change. Whatever it is, you have a list of, remember that list that you made of your dream job? Apply that list to what you're going to do if you stay. Make sense? And with that, I'm out of time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, that was fun.